So good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to the public lecture for this evening. Um, I uh, again want to thank Mrs. Claxon for this wonderful opportunity uh, for me to be able to uh, bring a wonderful friend and colleague uh, all the way from California to our sunny shores of Buffalo, um, uh, and really to have uh, what has been so far a wonderful series of interactions about um, issues related to preservation and conservation and I hope this evening will spark some more um, of those kinds of discussions. Uh, so quickly about Dr. Bricker. She is Professor of Architecture and the Director of Archives Special Collections in the School, uh, excuse me, in the College of Environmental Design at California State Polytechnic University at Pomona. She is former chair of the State Historic, uh, Historical Resources Commission of California, which is their State Historic Preservation Office. So she brings this whole host of um, experience with some, uh, as you can imagine, challenging cases related to um, designation issues. Uh, she's also former co-chair of the commission's committee on cultural resources of the modern age. Again, something that Buffalo is very familiar with and we are struggling with issues related to our own modern heritage. So hopefully it'll be a good um, conversation with Dr. Bricker. She is the former chair of the National Council for Preservation Education and co-curator of the Technology and Environment, the Southern California Post-War House, which was one in a series of exhibitions uh, at the Getty's Pacific Standard Time Presents Modern Architecture in LA. She is the author of The Mediterranean House in America, published in 2008, uh, co-author of the catalog Steel and Shade, The Architecture of Donald Wexler, which accompanied an exhibition of the same title in 2011. And she's currently working on a study of the American response to the form and ideology of European modernism, supported by a fellowship from the Clarence Stein Institute of Urban and Landscape Studies at Cornell University. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lauren Weiss Bricker. Thank you so much, Ashima, and I am incredibly honored to be here tonight. I want to express my sincere appreciation to Mrs. Clarkson and, and um, she and her husband, Will Clarkson, for having created these visiting uh, chair positions in, uh, in urban planning and in architecture. And I'm very honored to have been invited by Ashima and uh, with a tremendous support from uh, Dan Hess and of course, Dean Robert Shipley. So it's my great honor to be here with you. And as I've totally loved the time I've had here so far, uh, getting to know Buffalo and your um, tremendously uh, talented faculty and uh, students. I wonder if the lights come down a little bit or no? All right, so let me say a few things. What I, my thought tonight about tonight's presentation was to talk about some of uh, what I think of as some of the, oh, very good, some of the, <laughs> good, bad some of the current issues that are uh, foremost in, uh, pre in many of our minds with respect to historic preservation. Uh, certainly we think of historic preservation as a field devoted to the protection of significant places against the misguided acts of humans or the impact of natural disasters. While these issues remain of paramount concern, those of us in the field realize that we, the preservationists, may be responsible for some of the greatest losses of historic places owing to our own historical biases. Rather than bemoan what has occurred in the past, our great opportunity is to reassess the ways we interpret historic sites and develop strategies for maintaining the vitality of these places. 
and thinking about issues that are likely to have great impact on historic places in the near future. We must join the chorus comprised of other disciplines to develop strategies to address climate change, with particular attention to the impact of rising sea levels. In historic preservation, our focus is on how these factors may imp impact historic buildings, landscapes, and infrastructure. Limited resources, however, may force us to make some hard decisions, as suggested by Michelle L. Berenfeld in her 2016 essay, Planning for Permanent Emergency, Triage as a Strategy for Managing Cultural Resources Threatened by Climate Change. See, she suggests that we need to reach some level of consensus on value and significance and how resources are allocated. She sorts sites into three categories. Goners, those that are unlikely to survive another generation without heroic efforts. Sites that could survive for decades with thoughtful maintenance, and those sites that are so important that we'll, we, will, we will save them at all costs. We need only look to our recent disastrous hurricane season to recognize the importance of Berenfeld's assertions. While it's premature to conduct an adequate assessment of the impact and solutions to the hurricanes that impact Texas, Florida, and Puerto Rico, New Orleans experience in the years following Hurricane Katrina of 2005 reflect the complexity of reaching a shared consensus. Mm -mm. One illustration of the triage method was the approach taken to New Orleans Holy Cross neighborhood in the Lower Ninth Ward, a district that was inundated by six feet of water resulting from a breach of the Industrial Canal levee. The World Monuments Funder, WMF, uh, partnered with Preservation Trades Network and the University of Florida's College of Design, Construction, and Planning. These groups chose Holy Cross as a district whose future recovery was most in jeopardy for the following reasons. Its population largely displaced uh, 18 months after the storm, less than 500 of its 5,500 residents had returned, failure of insurance companies to compensate for losses and delays in the restoration of utilities and infrastructure, a classic case of a politically underrepresented community being ignored, and then thirdly, working with the Holy Cross Neighborhood Association, WMF, focused on projects that had the potential to strengthen the community and provide training for those residents who remained and others who might choose to return. One of the buildings rehabilitated by the partner was partners was the 1916 Greater Little Zion Missionary Baptist Church. It helped anchor the community and was a center of activity for the, for the community. When the church was flooded, its wooden floor, pews, and seating, uh, excuse me, heating and ventilation systems were destroyed, forcing the congregation to hold Sunday services in a tent in the side yard. Working with members of the congregation, the partners repaired the church's timber frame structure, replaced the wooden floors with historically appropriate materials and techniques, and with the group Architects for Humanity, repaired the historic paneling and wooden ceiling. Participation of the University of Florida students in this and other projects underscores the importance of so-called trades education, a long-term commitment of the Preservation Trades Network, and this is a topic that we touched on yesterday in one of our meetings, the importance of focusing on the trades. While the motivations of the World Monuments Fund and their partners to rebuild Holy Cross centered on efforts to stabilize the community, other factors in New Orleans were critical of local preservation efforts. Seeing, them, um, seeing this effort as overshadowing the citizens and the living culture of the city, which could be better captured by its music and artistic life. They equated preservation efforts 
with the financial motivation, which they suggested was, was, mo was underlying Lieutenant Governor Mitch Lowry's Louisiana rebirth of affordable, house it's a affordable housing initi initiative, seen as essentially creating housing for hospitality workers to serve the city's tourism industry. These critics saw historic preservation as outside the realm of the cultural life of the city and fundamentally a tool of capitalism. Historic preservation is an easy target for such a critique owing to the significant financial investment it requires, often only attainable by the wealthy and those who use it for personal gain. Another important direction in the field of historic preservation is the effort to democratize preservation so that it encompasses places significant to our entire population. Thank you for the water. Uh -huh. Excuse me. In particular, the effort has been an examination of federal programs dealing with preservation. Top of the list would be the National Park Service's National Historic Landmark Program that focuses on historic properties that illustrate the heritage of the United States. And the National Register of Historic Places, uh, the so-called official list of the nation's historic places worthy of preservation. Among historians, archaeologists, and others using these federal programs, many view their definition of historic places as exclusionary, omitting or undervaluing the significant historic roles played by the nation's ethnic people, women, and LGBTQ communities. In response to this critique, the Park Service has commissioned new theme studies for its NHL program that will that will lead to the designation of properties reflective of a broader constituency. The initial theme study was uh, entitled American Latinos and the Making of the United States, dating from 2013, and most recently, Finding a Path Forward, Asian American Pacific Islander uh, National Historic Landmarks from 2018. The focus on properties associated with underrepresented communities has identified se several systemic biases. These include, it's easier to substantiate an individual's association with a property if they owned rather than rented the property. Often underrepresented groups don't have the means to own property or they are not the original occupants of the building. Likewise, originality in design and materials is favored over alterations, which may have been made by later owners. The physical condition of a property will affect the evaluation of a building's integrity, which is defined as the ability of a property to convey its historical associations and attributes. Some members of underrepresented groups have questioned the concept of an over, what they see as an overemphasis on the physical appearance of a building as, as a primary means to communicate its historic significance. They suggest that a fuller measure of a building's importance can more accurately be conveyed by standards of authenticity that encompass intangible attributes. Sources for such information may be oral histories, or, um, uh, which, or an emphasis, excuse me, on uh, narrative traditions. Tied to this debate are the financial incentives, inevitably, right? Um, notably, the Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program, which tends to emphasize an assessment of the physical status of the buildings, the physical condition of historic properties, um, and, uh, and seeing that as a more objective means of interpreting the building than uh, anything uh, less tangible. You've been looking at uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe Mission Church, or uh, also known as Mc, uh, McDonnell Hall in San Jose, California. This was uh, recently listed as a National Historic Landmark, and I can tell you it was a very controversial process. Let me briefly tell you a little bit about the background. The nomination was prepared by Professor Ray Rast. The original parish church dates, which you're seeing a view of on the left, dates to 1914 with a later addition in 1923. 
It was sold in 1953 and relocated, rebuilt, and reconsecrated as a mission chapel. The interior was resheathed in uh, lath and, uh, re excuse me, resheathed with lath and plaster, but the plan remained intact. Between 1974 and 75, it was repositioned on the existing parcel, renovated and converted to a parish hall. With the deconsecration of the chapel, a number of features were removed and new interior partitions were aided to create additional spaces to meet the building's new function. The building is significant because of its association with Cesar Chavez, who with his brother Richard relocated and rebuilt the church in 1953. From 53 to 58, it functioned as a parish church and multi-purpose center. This, this structure was the meeting place for the community service organization, the most important Mexican-American civil rights organization in the immediate post-war period. It was a dynamic place where Chavez was encouraged to weave together lessons from Catholic social doctrine that he learned from Father Donald McDonnell with community organizing skills that he learned from CSO organizer Fred Ross. The building provided the space for activities associated with Mexican civil rights advocacy, Catholic ministry, and ongoing efforts to organize ethnic Me Mexican farm workers. It is the historic property that most closely is associated with the first phase of Chavez's career um, as a community organizer, civil rights leader, and labor rights leader. In hearings about the NHL designation, uh, there was little debate about its significance. Instead, more questions were raised about its integrity, as you can imagine with all these changes. Uh, Dr. Ray Rast, who actually is an, is an expert on Chavez and had contributed to, contributed to the American Latino theme study, noted that the footprint and overall form of the building remained consistent with its appearance in 1950 three to 58, the period of its significance, and ultimately retained a high degree of integrity, especially in the areas of feeling and association. The property was listed as an NHL in 2016. Part of the widening view of historically significant sites is a recognition of intangible resources known through narrative and memory rather than material remains. I've already alluded to this. This is a term that was first coined in about 1982 uh, at a UNESCO meeting held in Mexico City. And essentially, they define this as, uh, they define the importance of the need to pr preserve, study, and present intangible heritage, particularly known through oral traditions. Uh, methodologies long associated with, anthro with anthropologists, excuse me, anthropologists and ethnographers um, may come into play with these sites, especially in the effort to understand daily life. The Park Service has attempted to address this category of resources as traditional cultural properties, a designation habitually associated with Native American and Pacific Islanders. Increasingly, this term is being applied to sites important to other groups. Somewhat more complex are the intangible resources associated with the darker moments of our history, where the loss of physical evidence may be the result of an effort to erase a disgraceful moment in our past. Such a, such a site is Tuna Canyon Detention Center, or TCDS, formerly located at the northern boundary of the city of Los Angeles at the foothills of the Angeles National Forest. TCDS was built between 1933 and 41 as a camp for the Civilian Conservation Corps who were engaged in various road improvements, brush clearance, firefighting uh, efforts <clears throat> uh, associated with the Angeles Forest. 
the camp consisted of barracks, a mess hall, administration building, and infirmary. Immediately after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the CCC camp was closed and the site became the Tuna Canyon Detention Station, a temporary internment camp for Japanese, Japanese American, German, and Polish detainees operated by the Immig Immigration and Nationalization Service, INS. We're still talking about them. Detainees were eventually transferred to semi-permanent detention centers that included Fort Lincoln, North Dakota, and Fort Missoula in Montana. By 1942, 1,490 Japanese and Japanese American men had been processed at the station. In that year, the station was closed and after several changes of ownership was sold in 1960 to the Verdugo Hills Golf Course, whose owners cleared the site and re-landscaped it. All that remains from that time of the TCDS is a group of ancient oak trees. Today, the site is a subject of a proposed subdivision. In response to a request from former LA City Councilman Richard Alicarn, the Little Landers Historical Society, a local preservation organization, submitted an application to have this site designated due to its historical associations. The city's Cultural Heritage Commission declined the designation, asserting that the site lacked historic integrity. However, because the preservation, their preservation ordinance allows for the des designation of sites of historic or cultural significance, and because the request for the designation came from city council, which can override the commissioner's decisions, the property was determined to be eligible for listing and was since formally listed. The new property owner has taken legal action to oppose a designation. This is still pending. The <clears throat> Little Lander Society uh, formed a, a, a specific coalition to fight for the designation. They received grants from the Park Service and other sources to document uh, the site. What I'm showing you are a series of historic photographs that come from a photographic album of Officer Merrill Scott, the INS director who opened the camp. Scott actually has been described as somebody who has been, was somewhat compassionate to the prisoners, allowing them to engage in self-government uh, and um, essentially run m many of their operations. So uh, I have, but I, one has to say that if you're going to deal with a site that where it has basically been scraped clean, you must have good historic documentation to back up what you're you're actually you know focusing on, uh, and uh, these historic photographs made all the difference. So you see a series of um, uh, structures here. I have some more details in a minute. Here's the plan. I'm sorry, it's a little bit difficult to read. And uh, this, what we're looking at here is actually a, uh, a, a presentation board that was organized when the, the group uh, uh, put together their, their presentation for the designation. So what you see here uh, is a photograph that is showing you a view of the fence and you can see a kind of a lookout tower here. You see boys playing in the foreground. Um, another view of the fence here uh, and uh, views uh, looking from the interior, um, uh, excuse me, from the exterior looking inward. Another view here. Uh, perhaps easier to read is an interior view of the, um, the infirmary and the kitchen, and this is the mess hall. I have more detailed photos that are larger that will make this clear to you. This is the mess hall, again, from the CCC period, and here's a view of the entrance gate. <coughs> So um, as you can see, this is a, a photo of the officer guard commanding the camp and, and the various um, uh, equipment that he had. Views of the mess hall, very much uh, in that kind of rustic uh, character that m many CCC uh, projects were uh, um, 
employed, board and batten siding, and then the interior of the mess hall. And then uh, what you're seeing are a series of view, a series of buildings. On the left is uh, the uh, hospital at, at the distance, barracks at the right, and uh, officers' quarters significantly outside the fence and a view of two men uh, within uh, the recreation hall. So what has happened is that uh, the, the developers have proposed uh, in an effort to uh, somewhat appease the uh, concerns of the local uh, group, have, have proposed a, a commemorative park. And <clears throat> just to orient you, so here's an aerial view of the site. You're looking at the golf club uh, house, if you will, uh, right by the, uh, by the road and the, the open space beyond it. And here's the, the pro shop on the plan. And so the idea was that uh, these are the ancient oaks that have been referred to. And, and so there would be something like an acre park that would be uh, set aside. Actually, the city requires a two acre uh, open space requirement. So we'll see what happens. <clears throat> Uh, on, the view, on the left is a view of uh, what are characterized as uh, these ancient oaks. It was suggested that the, uh, the coalition sponsoring the designation hold a Shinto purification ceremony. And this was held by uh, Reverend, Reverend Yoshi Toshuki, uh, son of a detainee, uh, Taichi Tachuki. <clears throat> and this was held on uh, December 16th. Uh, 2013. Uh, prior to the event, the Reverend went to the site to breathe the air and see the mature oaks. The uh, coalition hopes that the ceremony will give their activities a fresh start. <clears throat> Another dimension of the reevaluation of sites that are worthy of um, preserving. Uh, relates to properties that date from uh, somewhat more uh, recent times. There's a broad terminology that's used in preservation circles of the recent past. Uh, and initially, this concept uh, basically began in 1945, right after the conclusion of World War II and extended into the early 70s. Now we're really pushing into the 70s um, uh, deeper into the 70s and the uh, 1980s. <clears throat> the obstacles to preserving such works, I think, are uh, well illustrated in this view. So you see in the foreground is uh, looking like essentially a terraced garden is, of course, uh, the Oakland Museum, designed by uh, Roach Dinkelow, Kevin Roach being the lead designer. And uh, the landscape architect was Dan Kiley. And um, in the, in the uh, distance is a view of the Alameda County Courthouse. So in a very, uh, I think, useful article uh, in terms of understanding the concerns about the uh, uh, interpreting the recent past, uh, written by Richard Longstreth of George Washington University, and the article has this uh, kind of uh, delightful name, uh, title of, I don't see it, I don't understand it, and it doesn't look old to me. Um, and this was published in the mid-1990s when uh, preservationists really started kind of organizing their thoughts about uh, uh, recognizing more recent works. And one of the important comments that Longstreth makes is that uh, many of these modern uh, works that are, um, uh, that are really part of the modern canon taught in architecture and planning programs today um, are, are somewhat antithetical to more traditionally preserved buildings, such as where you can see a very clear profile of the building uh, that could um, 
as, as it projects against the larger skyline of the city versus a situation uh, like we have at Oakland uh, with, excuse me, with the, with the museum where it's very much uh, um, set into this site. Here's another view of it, and I don't know if some of you have visited this site, but it's, uh, the museum is really, a, I think, quite a beautiful uh, complex. It was created as a means of consolidating three existing art and natural history uh, museums. <clears throat> And uh, here's a view of it, of the entrance. This has been uh, modified more recently. And just a, a couple of drawings in an interior view to give you an idea of how it sits on the site. So you obviously see a series of terraces that are set down into, uh, into the site. And here, uh, I think this very helpful section. So you see the uh, planting screen, uh, a kind of pergola screening, and the way this space sets down into the site. And so the experience of the galleries is uh, totally uh, underground. And <clears throat> on the left is uh, a display that relates to uh, the discovery of gold in, in California. Another um, important work that is uh, very much from this uh, post-war period is uh, the uh, Edward Durrell Stone Stewart Pharmaceutical uh, located in Pasadena, dates from 1958. The landscape architect was Thomas Church, and I want to specifically emphasize that. Uh, very often, uh, we assume that a project comes because of the um, reputation of the architect. In this case, it was Thomas Church's reputation that got the job, and then he, uh, in turn, brought in Stone, uh, with whom he had worked on other projects. So as you see, uh, the, it's located in, uh, in Pasadena, and <clears throat> Uh, here's a view from the building looking out, and you can see that the building uh, sits pretty close to the road. It actually sits uh, fairly low to the site, uh, and that church uses planting and water features a, as a kind of a, a buffer between uh, the street and, and the building. Let's, let me just go back to uh, say a couple things about the design of the building. So. The, the, the building very much has kind of signature features associated with Stone's uh, work. Certainly this, this cast concrete screen that you see here, and also this uh, kind of modernized interpretation of classical architecture is very evident with these, these uh, kind of thin attenuated uh, columns or supports, and, um, uh, and then of course the projecting uh, roof surface. Of course, with this water feature, the building very much seems to be floating on its, uh, from its site. Uh, this view gives you an idea of what happens behind this um, screen. Uh, and, and so as you can see, the site drops, and uh, there is a pool. And uh, this beautiful sunshade element of uh, constructed of molded plywood. So when you look at a view like this, you know one does not ordinarily expect to see a pool at a uh, in, in a place of employment, um, or uh, this view of the uh, uh, this very sort of grand uh, atrium that dr then drops down to a, the lower level. This is actually a dining hall, and there was a kitchen off it, which in turn, and the dining hall opened on to the, um, uh, to the, the pool area. Uh, it, this is a beautiful case of a kind of corporate paternalism that was being practiced in the post-war period, this notion that when you went in in the morning, everything was sort of more or less taken care of for you, uh, and then you, you didn't leave. <laughs> they locked you in. You didn't leave until uh, the end of the work day. <clears throat> and, and this is not the only instance of it, but I think it's quite a, a nice example. 
Uh, and here is the site plan that gives you an idea of the uh, uh, completeness of the uh, activities all on this location. So just to orient you, obviously, here's, here's the pool. Uh, this is the, uh, the bridge over the water feature at the front. Uh, what's immediately behind the screen are the executive offices. And here's the uh, atrium that we saw um, in, in the photograph. And then what's indicated here are the labs, um, the uh, accountant's uh, office, pretty good size, IBM <laughs> specifically, obviously the computer, uh, mailroom, and then the warehouse. Um, and, um, and then, of course, uh, in addition to the pool, there's a, a pool house and uh, some other amenities, including the uh, uh, sunshade element. So what happened uh, here is, is kind of an interesting uh, story. So uh, I always find it helpful to uh, look for the pool in terms of identifying where the, uh, you know, to orient ourselves. So here's the pool, obviously, and, and you see the entire site outlined. But <clears throat> actually, this site, the outline uh, it includes not just the, uh, the building itself, but a new parking structure. So Pasadena, as is true of many other Southern California communities and, and really nationwide, is interested in transit-oriented development. And the, so the 210 freeway was a more recent freeway in uh, Southern California running along the, the foothill of the San Gabriel Mountains and, um, and then really right at, at the southern edge of uh, the uh, Stewart Pharmaceutical property. So <clears throat> Pasadena uh, commissioned a, a specific area plan to deal with development along the freeway, very much encouraging TOD uh, development. And it was clear that the uh, transportation agency was going to be building a parking structure and it had been built, and that the, uh, uh, there was a certain amount of pressure to develop uh, housing on the site of Stewart Pharmaceutical. In anticipation of this, Pasadena Heritage, the local preservation organization, had already had the property uh, listed in the National Register so that, you know, the, the fight was on, if you will. And here, they, and one has to be, you know, be fair about this. Here's an, a view on the, the upper image gives you an idea of the deteriorated condition of the property. And uh, the lower image is the uh, proposed uh, development. So you have Stewart here and uh, really just the front of Stewart and then the, uh, the new uh, condominiums that were projected to be built uh, behind. So <clears throat> what happened was that, um, and I, I, this is my kind of crude coloring of, of the site plan, so this was the original footprint of the building. The yellow is what was demolished and what remained was the front portion of the building. And uh, some of us uh, had some reservations about uh, the notion of lopping off more than 50% of a National Register property as any kind of a preservation solution, but we, we were in the minority, evidently, and uh, so the, the project uh, went forward. This gives you an idea of how uh, the developer was uh, imagining the project. So this is, uh, again, the, the entrance to the building, and then the drop down with the uh, dining hall opening onto the pool area, and then the new condominiums. <clears throat> And here's what it looks like today. This is known as the Stewart at Sierra Madre. So to orient you again, we have the screen here, right? You can see the drop down, the pool. And then what you're looking at here is the opposite view with the, these palms here. Palms were not part of Thomas Church's vocabulary. Um, and uh, the drop down, and then you see the density of the housing development around it. So it, um, 
you know, on the one hand, it's, it's a kind of a mixed bag, if you will. On the one hand, um, we do, we have the recognition the, of the Stewart Pharmaceuticals uh, building, uh, but then we have what some might consider a somewhat uh, disrespectful treatment of it. Uh, but had it not been designated, there's a reasonable chance we wouldn't have any of it. <clears throat> So I, I would say that the recent past is uh, getting the same kind of treatment that other periods of historic architecture can often be subject to, including uh, the, the more recent past um, moving forward. Uh, and this is uh, UC Santa Barbara's faculty club uh, designed by Charles Moore and uh, from 1968. And some of you may have been here. It's, uh, a, uh, I think, quite an interesting uh, reinterpretation of the Spanish tradition, but very much in the vocabulary of Charles Moore with these uh, shed roof compositions and uh, really quite interesting the way he, he wraps the site. The, uh, uh, if you're familiar with uh, some of Moore's buildings, you know that very often they are not well constructed. And so the uh, building uh, was, went into a, a long period of deterioration. And uh, a, uh, a donor came along who was personally offended by certain features of the building. And she uh, essentially committed the university to uh, uh, redoing the building. They, as you can see, some of the few uh, defining features of the building were retained, but much of the rest of it was totally rebuilt and, in addition, uh, uh, significantly uh, expanded. So we'll, tomorrow we'll be talking more. Uh, our panel discussion at the pavilion will be talking more about uh, these uh, many of these uh, issues related to uh, the pr preservation of modern architecture. I, I just wanted to conclude uh, with a few, uh, a few thoughts about where we are with respect to uh, the preservation movement. Uh, while it, uh, I don't mean to say, come off like I, you know, sort of negative about things, I do actually think that we're at a very exciting moment in the uh, preservation movement, both because uh, it, there are, uh, are clear signs that the movement is expanding and being much more responsive to our uh, ever-changing uh, de demographic, uh, and also because we have no choice, but we must respond to the issues raised by climate change and how our historic buildings uh, are, are, are going to fare and, and need to be protected. Uh, I think those of us who are teaching now uh, realize the responsibility we have to prepare uh, our uh, younger people to, to respond to many of these issues. And I think for this reason, um, preservation education remains uh, an extremely important aspect of not just the issue of uh, uh, old buildings, if you will, but it, it really uh, is an opportunity to draw broadly on issues related to architecture, um, urban planning, and really how we define our uh, important uh, places. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Lauren. That was uh, great. A lot of, um, I think, thought-provoking mm -hmm. uh, points to consider. Uh, at this point, I wanted to open it up to questions. Um, are there any questions for Lauren? Stunned silent. Oh, good. Brad? Hi, uh, thanks for the um, interesting lecture. I just, um, I work here in Buffalo and we, I do a lot of work with um, the historic tax credits and I was just curious in California how 
um, that um, process is going. I mean, especially with the last, well, the second to last project you showed, it's interesting that they didn't think about essentially maybe reusing the kind of mid-century part and then also doing the condos using tax credits as well as doing the new build part. I'm just wondering if developers are thinking that way in California, if they're just more thinking high rise and more density and all that stuff. Well, okay, so what happened with the Stewart Pharmaceutical was that the architect, the preservation architect who was hired to deal with the front portion of the building, which was really beautifully restored, actually made a pitch to do tax credits for the proposed new construction. And uh, a number of us, that is what you saw, severing the rear half and building new, and uh, you know, quickly, he was. <laughs> it was made very clear it wasn't going to go anywhere. Yeah. So uh, the I, I would say with regard to that project, uh, there was an effort, but it wasn't a suitable site given the mm -hmm. proposed project. I think I totally agree with you. It could have been an interesting opportunity to uh, insert. Uh, uh, new housing units within that building. And as you know, there is significant uh, flexibility on the part of the Park Service to allow, you know, some new openings. And, and if in the long run, the point is that you'll be able to keep the building. Mm -hmm. The, um, I would say in other respects, uh, the, the uh, Stark Tax Credit Program is going strong. In, uh, in California, particularly in the urban centers. It, in Los Angeles, it's um, critical to the what's referred to as the renaissance of downtown Los Angeles, where we have these large historic districts, particularly, say, around the area of Broadway, where we have, where we have a number of historic theaters. But in, that, in close proximity are uh, department stores and office buildings, and, and they have uh, very uh, successfully been converted to lofts or hotels. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. That that was interesting. Um, I'm just curious if there's a national commission that's been put together, or is it state by state, or is there is there some sort of nationally organized uh, way that the preservationists actually are prioritizing what is to be preserved and what isn't as we go as we address climate change? Because that's a huge. I mean, that would be of. I mean, that's it, it's just such a huge challenge. So is that state to state? Is it national? What's How's that moving forward? I, that's a very important question. Uh, I know that FEMA is uh, very much concerned about uh, preparation uh, with you know, f throughout the country uh, in anticipation of uh, various disasters, including climate change, and that they have for quite a while been interested in historic buildings. I am assuming that they are working in conjunction with the National Park Service to try to develop guidelines, but frankly, at this point, the impetus seems to be coming uh, both from the states and from individual groups. I know that there's a group that was put together, um, uh, there, Guy Nordenson, who is uh, on the faculty at Princeton, has headed up this effort to look to uh, ways uh, in the post-Sandy period to make those communities, uh, uh, you know, put them in a better position in response to rising waters. And so I think it tends to be sort of nonprofits and uh, individual groups, uh, and I am not aware of any kind of n national overall commitment to doing that, but it certainly needs to be done. Yeah, no question. Yeah. Professor Bricker, I was fascinated to um, look at the example that you gave us on uh, efforts at democratization, the mm -hmm. Our Lady of Guadalupe. And my question is, if contemporary preservation practice seeds the original buildings, 
uh, are uh, as being less important than the culture being preserved, and that there are other uh, intangibles that can serve the purpose of cultural preservation. I wonder how it is we remember without the visual clues of the original architecture. In other words, I, I grasp the point about there being mechanisms other than the object. Right. But Ann Clarkson and I spent 16 years together working on the Buffalo City Arts Commission. Mm -hmm. And it is the object at some point that triggers the memory. If the object is radically redone to a point where it is visually unrecognizable, what is it that supports the memory and how does the untrained observer who happens upon the place get the information? Sure. So what the argument was there. So the, I mean, I, I have shown you probably the toughest example of this. There's lot, there are many other examples that are um, where, where the property has not been changed as much as it, I mean, it was moved, it was repositioned, it was scraped, it, you know, it was like, there's a long list and still the, the spirit is there. And um, I, th I think what ends up happening is that the, uh, there's a, you almost sort of relinquish, this is, this is the premise, you relinquish the, uh, the sort of physical markers um, almost entirely, not quite, but almost entirely, because the significance of the site is so important. And, and I think part of the strength of this argument was that some of the changes were done by Cesar Chavez and his brother. And, and so that made, that made it the alterations more direct. It also is where these activities took place. And, but I, you know, I understand what you're saying. And, I, and I, here's the other thing that I would say. We go in, in preservation, like most disciplines, there's this sort of pendulum, right, that, that swings. And, and for the, a lo the longest time, the physicality and the, the uh, integrity of, uh, uh, was measured by the physicality was the principal um, way that we recognized place. And then, then we informed our recognition by understanding the history and the cultural identity and all that sort of thing. And, and I think increasingly the pendulum is in this other direction. And I showed you about the most radical example that I could cook up right now. I mean, I didn't make it up, but I thought, you know, I think it's important to kind of think about it. What I ultimately, my personal, my personal hope is that we come back to a sort of a middle ground where we can, uh, we can respect both sides of it. And I think this is particularly important for our young designers, is that we do not relinquish the importance of design and materiality on, on many levels. I, I personally, I feel that is, is important, but I, I, I must say that I, I want to respect the, um, uh, and, and bring to your attention, if you weren't already aware of it, how, how far some of these issues are being assessed. Um, and, and, I, and I do think that there is a, uh, a very strong feeling that, uh, particularly with groups that have been marginalized, in, uh, in many ways, uh, historically, and then in terms of the preservation movement there, where, you know, with these theme studies, there, there's a, a, sp a particular focus on them. So I'm, I'm actually, I'm presenting this. I think it's important. I ultimately, if, I, if you were to ask what would be my recommendation, it, it would be something a little bit closer to the middle if that makes any sense. I'm happy to talk some more about this, but yeah, go ahead.
Thank you for the presentation. Um, I know you spoke a little bit about the democratization of historic preservation, but I was wondering um, what were the specific practices or methods for combating the stigmatization that um, historic preservation is elitist? Well, <clears throat> they, in part, it has to do with the uh, idea of bringing forward the history of groups that have been marginalized, and that's the purpose of these theme studies. The National Historic Landmarks Program has for a long time had theme studies. I think what must have happened was that initially it was just these individual, most important, you know, kind of uh, uh, George Washington's home, that, that kind of level of significance, and then as a way of broadening the base for NHLs, and all, uh, they developed these theme studies, and the emphasis with these theme studies was very much on a kind of comparative analysis. Um, and, um, and so, but those theme studies were still not, not as, uh, as not sufficiently based on the history of groups such as the uh, Latino Americans, um, the uh, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders, the LGBTQ communities. Um, and so those theme studies, and that's one that's coming along, it hasn't been published yet. Um, so it's to bring forward the information about these uh, places uh, and uh, the, the background and the places associated with the history of these groups, and also this concern about reassessing the way we look at integrity. So that we, because integrity has forever been this uh, way of kind of measuring the physical status uh, or the, um, the, the equating the phys physical status of a building with. Um, its historic uh, significance. And so <clears throat> uh, we, I think we need increasingly to broaden our research so that we include narratives. Also, we need to think not just in terms of who was the original owner, what did the original building look like, but to acknowledge change as is true, one, one really can think of these buildings as organic in many ways, and that they evolve over time, and the way they evolve is through their associations with different people and in response to changing uh, conditions. hope that clarifies things, yeah. Any other? <laughs> so, okay. I had a question, if I may. Yeah, please. So, um, the tuna can, can, canyon example, yeah. um, the site is privately owned, correct? Right. Is there any, has there been any effort to include the local community in the reinterpretation efforts uh, when, when thinking about the uh, redesign for the park? Um, because, you know, uh, as we've discussed uh, earlier, the, these kinds of sites that are traumatic for uh, many communities, often there is a disconnect between um, you know, interpretation efforts and what the community really wants reflected um, uh, as how they want to interact with, with that site that has these negative associations um, with, with their history. And so that's why, uh, that's, uh, I, so I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Well, the coalition is comprised of uh, both members of that local preservation organization and others who were, uh, for instance, um, relatives of former detainees and uh, others in the, uh, particularly in the Japanese American community. So I think the, because the site is so absent of any of the buildings associated with the camp, really, what is left are those trees, those oak trees. And that's, uh, my sense is that there's, there's a consensus that those oak trees are the marker of that earlier period.
Thank you. Sorry for that delay. Uh, thank you for a lovely presentation. It's really terrific. I'd like to put a hypothetical to you uh, okay. uh, that's tied to the history of this region okay. and just invite your reflection on it. And it's it's tied to the Tuna Canyon kind of, uh, kind of the the histories that the that they don't always want to acknowledge and that need to be carried forward in some fashion. We have uh, we are the site of some of the largest Superfund uh, um, in encounters and some of those sites have been what created Superfund funding. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think now particularly of Love Canal in Niagara Falls. As a school and as a studio environment, we have explored how best to interpret a site of that scale and magnitude and um, a, a kind of horror in some respects and met considerable local resistance. That's my home, it's my city, it's my town. I don't want the, the 14 million tourists who come to visit Niagara Falls on both sides of the border to, to be exposed to that history, while at the same time we run risks of not interpreting those things. So I'd, I'd be curious about your notions of such a designation sometime in the future, given many of the houses are gone, but not all, and some um, new ones have been built, which is equally scary. <laughs> well, I, I think it, implicit in your question is this, uh, yes, I would agree that there needs to be recognition. Uh, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think we should be afraid to recognize these uh, sites. In fact, if we don't, we're cleansing our history in a way that none of us, I think, would be comfortable if we read uh, textbooks that uh, uh, denied uh, the role of slavery in our history and, you know, various other um, uh, tragic and dark moments. So I don't know why preservation should really be any different. It's what's more challenging are some of the, the questions that Al raised, that, that the, the, the physical connection uh, has uh, always be, been a, an appeal that we have, uh, that has been inherent in preservation. You, you look at a building and it immediately, or whatever it is, landscape, and you have that kind of visceral connection. Now, and that actually might suggest even more so the retention of uh, any of the, uh, the remnants. So one can be reminded that um, this shouldn't be repeated. Yeah, I mean, it's very much the debate that uh, went on with the 9-11 memorial site. Should we just move forward um, and not uh, have any reference to what was clearly a, a, a terrible uh, event? Or do we need to give ourselves the opportunity to contemplate the impact of that event? So I... I but, you know, the, the reality is just I, perhaps in the case with a Love Canal site and also what happened in Manhattan, there's a lot of, uh, there's this counter economic pressure and also counter argument that we need to show that we move forward, that we're, there's a positive. So it's a balance, right? In a democracy, we do that. Um, other thoughts, questions? Oh, 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 there's an, one oh, more. That yeah, she's got one. Uh, I have a little basic question that uh, while doing the presentation, or like preservation or relocation works, um, how is it the government design requirements like accessibility or fire are fulfill, fulfilled? Uh, like in rare cases, are they excused? Um, for like uh, giving value to the historic, um, no, no, like no, no. They they are always considered. Considered. So modifications to make to improve accessibility, life safety issues are absolutely a part of the process. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, anyone else? <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much to everyone for coming and
Thank you, Dr. Bricker, for a very thought-provoking discussion. Thank you.